Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on Reason and Theology. Let's go over papal heresy, specifically in Bishop Athanasius Schneider's credo or his new catechism. I found the instances that he presented about papal heresy very interesting. Um, we're going to go through those case by case and see if the Pope actually taught heresy. But one particular case that stands out the most is uh, Pope Francis is brought up here as teaching heresy in two instances by Bishop Athanasius Schneider. And what's curious about one of the instances, as I'll show to you, is that Bishop Athanasius Schneider knows, because Pope Francis directly spoke to him about this, he knows that Pope Francis has not taught heresy in the instance that Schneider raises. Pope Francis spoke directly to him, clarified his words. So Schneider knows that there was no heresy here, but he does not provide any of that clarity to the audience who reads Credo. And so knowing that the Pope does not teach heresy here, Schneider still presents this as an instance where Pope Francis teaches heresy. Make of that whatever you will, but I will demonstrate that conclusively today, in addition to engaging the other instances of papal heresy or alleged papal heresy instances uh, that he raises. So <clears throat> let me share my screen so that we can go over the catechism itself and take a look at it. Uh, it asks the question, have there been cases in history of popes teaching or promoting doctrinal errors. Now, when we speak of doctrinal errors, there's a very, very wide range of errors. The errors that he is referring to explicitly is the error of heresy, um, because, again, it is explicitly mentioned here. Heresy is what is uh, addressed in the actual answer, and all of the instances are instances of heresy accusations. So just because he doesn't use the word heresy in the question doesn't mean he's not referring to heresy because in the answer, it is clear that the scope of the question is specifically the category of heresy. Okay, so let's look at the first instance. He says in the answer, yes, although such cases have been very rare, they include Honorius I, who wrote letters with erroneous statements about the two wills of Jesus Christ and was positively condemned a heretic by the Council of Constantinople. Now, those of y'all who come from a Protestant background, probably know about this because this is a Protestant argument. Little interesting that we see a Catholic bringing it up. Uh, none, nevertheless, we still need to engage it rather than just merely noting that it's a Protestant argument. I'm going to show why this is false. Well, let's address the case of Honorius. Well, as I've mentioned before, not only did Pope Honorius not actually teach the heresy of monothelitism? That is clear if you just read his letters. Number two, one of his successors, Pope John IV, wrote an entire apology showing that his predecessor, Honorius, did not teach heresy. And he was in a privileged position to know it because the work makes use of Honorius's own secretary who wrote the letters. So the secretary who wrote the letters for Honorius is in a position to know what Honorius meant. So that, of course, is brought up. Um, I would also point to Maximus the Confessor and many others who defended the Pope, showing he did not teach heresy. This is a historical fact that he did not teach heresy. Um, now, we still need to address the issue of the Council of Constantinople, uh, Constantinople III, from 680 to 681. Well, you know, I'll share my screen and show you a couple interesting points here. 
Not only did the six ecumenical council teach papal infallibility, and not only did the council fathers accept papal infallibility, they also accepted the view that Pope Honorius did not teach heresy. You heard me correctly. The same council that is referenced here by Schneider as condemning the Pope for heresy is the same council who, in sessions prior to that, cleared the name of all of the popes from the charge of heresy. Let me just review that with you very briefly here. Here's from a letter from Pope Agatho, read at the Six Ecumenical Council, written to the emperor, read at the council out loud, and all of the council fathers accepted this letter. And they, in fact, explicitly wrote back to the Pope as part of the council, and they explicitly accepted everything in the letter. And watch what the letter says. For this is the rule of the true faith, which the spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire, the Apostolic Church of Christ, has both in prosperity and in adversity always held and defended with energy which it will be proved by the grace of Almighty God, has never erred from the path of the apostolic tradition. Now, right there, it's very clear. The letter that the Council Fathers accept is saying that Rome has never erred from the path of apostolic tradition. That is, it has never taught heresy. Nor has she been depraved by yielding to heretical innovations. There you go. She has never yielded to heresy. But from the beginning, she has received the Christian faith from her founders, the princes of the apostles of Christ, and remains undefiled unto the end. So he's saying, Rome will always be faithful in its teaching. It will never teach heresy. It will be undefiled unto the end, unto the end of time. And this is based on Jesus' promise. It says, according to the divine promise of the Lord and Savior himself, which he uttered in the Holy Gospels to the prince of his disciples, saying, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Let your tranquil clemency, therefore, consider, since it is the Lord and Savior of all, whose faith it is, that promised that Peter's faith should not fail, and exhorted him to strengthen his brethren, how it is known to all that the apostolic pontiffs, the predecessors of my littleness, have always confidently done this very thing. Now, right here, who was one of Pope Agatha's predecessors? Well, Pope Honorius is one of those predecessors. And the Pope is very clearly at this council saying, all of his predecessors have been undefiled in their teaching authority. They have never yielded to heresy. And the council fathers wrote back, and accepted this. So anytime we bring up the claim that Constantinople III condemned Pope Honorius for heresy, you have to consider this is the same council who also claimed all of the popes, including Honorius, have never taught heresy. Now, is there a contradiction here with the council fathers? Did they change their mind? I don't think we have to resort to a contradiction. Here's one way to harmonize these two acts. Whenever they say that Honorius and all of the other popes have never taught heresy, they're talking about the teaching authority of the pope in his magisterium, in his actual official teachings, he's never taught heresy. Later on, whenever they condemn him as a heretic, they do so as a judgment about Honorius in his private person, not in his teaching authority, not in his magisterium. In other words, they're making the distinction between Honorius as an individual and a private person, 
what we might call perhaps material heresy, where you're not aware that you're teaching heresy, but there's heresy there, um, versus actually teaching it in your magisterium. You know, a person could privately hold to heresy and not know it without actually teaching it. Um, and it's certainly the case that somebody like a pope could be misinformed on something. Uh, so unintentionally unaware that something he privately holds to is heretical. That's possible. And so what they're doing is they're judging Honorius in his private person, not in any of his teachings, not in any of his official papal acts, but rather just saying he privately held to a heresy unknowingly. Whereas in several sessions prior to this, they clear all popes, including Honorius, of any accusation that they have taught heresy. So there I just offered you, you a way to harmonize this without saying, you know what, these council fathers are just flip-flopping. They don't know what they're talking about. They're denying their own teachings that they just accepted in a previous session. Um, and therefore, they're unreliable and we can't even take their Christology seriously because they're all over the place. Without resorting to that conclusion. Uh, because at that point, I think that the uh, entire Six Ecumenical Council and its endeavors uh, would be called into question. Rather than resorting to that, I offer the following as a way to harmonize them. But it's clear they are not accepting the, the proposition that the Pope actually teaches heresy in his magisterium, because not only do they clear all the predecessors of Agatho, they also want to say this is impossible anyway, because the Roman see will be undefiled unto the end. So if they were to contradict themselves, they would be contradicting their own teachings. Now, did they make a mistake on a matter of fact? Well, they certainly did not make any mistakes on faith and morals. They were spot on of faith and morals and everything that they taught. But did they make a mistake in judging Honorius as a person? The answer is yes. Because, again, Pope John IV and others have already shown, and, uh, well, John IV, Maximus, and others have already shown that Honorius did not hold to monothelitism in any kind of way, and that information is based on a person who was in that privileged position to know it because he was the Pope's secretary who actually wrote down the letters. And if you just read the letters, it's clear what he's saying. He's not affirming uh, two, conv you, know, you know, he's not affirming one uh, will in Jesus Christ. He's saying that the two wills of Jesus are not in contradiction to each other, and also the uh, humanity of Jesus is not in contradiction or in conflict with some element of concupiscence because he doesn't have concupiscence. So that's kind of the nuances that take place there uh, in Honorius. And so to bring this up as an issue uh, or an instance of the Pope propagating doctrinal errors or even heresy by Bishop Schneider is incredibly misinformed. And even uh, Anastasius Bibliothecarius, who was the papal librarian a couple centuries after Constantinople III, had noted and again, this is the papal librarian. <clears throat> he had noted that Constantinople III erred in its judgment about Honorius, not in its evaluation of teachings. They made no mistake there. They're infallible. But in their uh, judgment of him as a person, they an erred. And of course, no council and even no pope is infallible in matters of fact. They can be mistaken on those things. So a pope could be mistaken if he says, uh, something about science, for example, or if he says something about history, his history could be factually mistaken, or his understanding of science can be factually mistaken. Those are not protected by the Holy Spirit. Um, so, of course, when a council evaluates a particular person, they could err in their judgment of that person. They're not erring in their judgment about the heresy or the doctrine, but they could err in their evaluation of an individual. That's no long, That's nowhere protected by the Holy Spirit. Um, so, that is the case of um, Honorius. So already it is a strike 
uh, for Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Unfortunately, he seems to have uh, gotten this one really, really wrong. Let's see what else he says. He says, John the 22nd, who taught that the beatific vision of God is granted the saints only after the last judgment, and was widely condemned by the theologians outside the papal court before recanting on his deathbed. His position was corrected posthum posthumously by his successor, Benedict the Twelfth. Now, if y'all saw my show interacting with Scott Hahn on this point, you you know where the mistake is here, um, and that is if we simply look at what John the Twenty Second was doing, he nowhere taught this in his magisterium, and he himself was the one who affirmed it uh, in the truth of the dogma. Um, and was actually going to promulgate it, but he had died, so it was his successor who promulgated the dogma. But he himself was going to pro promulgate the truth of the dogma. Um, again, to recap here, in the last years of John's pontificate, there arose a dogmatic conflict about the beatific vision, which was brought on by himself, and which his enemies made use of to discredit him. Before his elevation to the Holy See, he had written a work on this question, in which he stated that the souls of the blessed departed do not see God until after their last judgment. Rem I'll remind you at this point that matter had not been dogmatized yet, uh, so it would not have been considered um, <clears throat> formally a heretical proposition yet. After becoming Pope, he advanced the same teaching in his sermons. In this, he met with strong opposition. Many theologians who adhered to the usual opinion that the blessed departed did see God before the resurrection of the body and the last judgment, even calling his view heretical. A great commotion was aroused in the University of Paris when the general of the minorities and a Dominican tried to disseminate there the Pope's view. Pope John... So now the Pope writes this. Watch this. Pope John wrote to the king, King Philip IV, on the matter and emphasized that as long as the Holy See had not given a decision, the theologians enjoyed perfect freedom in this matter. Note that the Pope is saying this is an open discussion. Rome hasn't issued any judgments. He has not taught any uh, one way or another. He has not issued any judgments. So, in other words, these sermons of his were not authoritative, they were not magisterial, they were merely his private thoughts that he was disseminating to a local congregation. It was not for the whole church, and it certainly wasn't a teaching for the whole church. In December 1333, the theologians at Paris, after a consultation on the question, decided in favor of of the doctrine that the souls of the blessed departed saw God immediately after or after death or after their complete purification. At the same time, they pointed out that the Pope had given no decision on this question, but only advanced his personal opinion. So now listen to that. Even his critics, the ones that Schneider mentions, even his critics recognize the Pope had not actually taught this but it was only a private opinion that he had put forward. And now petitioned the Pope to confirm their decision. John appointed a commission at Avignon to study the writings of the fathers and to discuss further the disputed question. In a consistory held on 3rd of January 1334, the Pope explicitly declared that he had never meant to teach contrary to Holy Scripture or the rule of faith, and in fact had not intended to give any decision whatsoever. Before his death, he withdrew his former opinion and declared his belief that souls departed, that the souls departed from their bodies enjoyed in heaven the beatific vision. So in other words, the case of John the 22nd only shows 
that a pope in his private person could be mistaken. It wasn't even formally heresy at the time. So you can't even say that he was formally or that he was formally somehow holding to heresy. If we even want to speak of material heresy, that's debatable because again, it wasn't even dogmatized yet. But did he hold to an error privately? Yes, he did. Did he teach it in his magisterium? No, he did not. But if you read Credo, you're going to get the impression that that is what is being said here, that somehow he is teaching this. That is the impression you're going to get from Credo. And so it's unfortunate we don't hear this other side of the story that puts things into perspective and does not yield to the position that the popes can teach heresy in their magisterium. Okay, let's continue to go through Credo and see some other instances that are brought up. Uh, specifically, the very troubling instance where Schneider himself raises a, an instance where Pope Francis allegedly has taught heresy, and yet Schneider is in a privileged position to know that that is not true, and yet he doesn't tell this to his audience in Credo. That's a little troubling. Again, make of that whatever you will, but here it is. I will share my screen and we'll review it together, and I will back up what I'm saying with the facts. I will present the evidence. It says, in our own time, Pope Francis has publicly signed a document affirming the pluralism and diversity of religions are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. Now, <clears throat> that should sound familiar to you because I've done a video on this, in fact, several on the Abu Dhabi house and the document that Pope Francis signed there. And when it speaks of the pluralism and diversity of religions being willed by God, some people thought that this meant God wills error. In other words, you know, God doesn't really have any truth. All ways are the way to, to heaven. You know, all these different conflicting religions, they're all true, which would, of course, be absurd and heretical if that's what Pope Francis is saying by God wills all the diversity of religions. So that would be heretical if that's what he means. But what did he mean? Well, we'll, we'll see here uh, from Schneider himself. He doesn't tell this to us in Credo. He just merely throws out the accusation. But he doesn't show us what Pope Francis has said in reference to that accusation directly to Bishop Schneider. You heard that correctly. Rather than skip all over this document, I'll just take you to the relevant parts. This is from an article, Bishop Schneider, Pope's revised diversity of religions takes uh, take remains insufficient. This was on October 29th, 2019 by Schneider himself. Okay, so he is the author of this. And this is on uh, 1 Peter 5. And I will put a link to it in the show notes so you could take a look at it. Because Schneider had spoken to Pope Francis specifically about this accusation and concern. Now watch this. He's asked, Your Excellency, was Pope Francis's clarification of the Abu Dhabi document at the April 3rd, 2019 Wednesday general audience sufficient in your view? And what are your thoughts on his remarks? Now, already you have to ask the question, hey, what audience on April 3rd, 2019? Schneider didn't tell me anything about an audience clarifying this. I'm part of Pope Francis. So you mean to tell me Pope Francis has clarified this in a general audience publicly? And Schneider never told us about this in Credo? You heard correctly. That is accurate. Well, here's what he says. At the Wednesday audience on April 3rd, 2019, Pope Francis spoke these words, quote, Why does God allow many religions? God wanted to allow this 
scholastic theologians used to refer to God's permissive will. He wanted to allow this reality. There are many religions. Now, permissive will, what is that in reference to? Okay, permissive will is God doesn't actually want this to be the case, but because he allows for free will, he will allow his creatures to do something sinful. Even though he doesn't want them to do something sinful, he will allow them. I'll give you an example. Let's say Bishop Schneider uh, has accused the Pope of teaching heresy, which he has. He has signed a document doing that to which he has never repudiated to this day. He has done that. Um, he is mistaken, though, correct? Yes. So is that an instance of Schneider unintentionally bearing false witness against the papal magisterium? Yes. Is that a problem? Yes. Is that is that something that God wills uh, directly? No. Of course not. God does not will bearing false witness, but he allows it. He permits the bearing of false witness whenever Schneider does this against the Pope. He permits it because he allows creatures to abuse free will, to say things based on ignorance or whatever the case may be. God knows that murder occurs does he wish someone to be murdered? Does he directly will that? No, but he permits it. So when we speak of permissive will, that's what we're referring to. He permits it. And insofar as he permits it, we could speak of God willing those things, not directly, not actively, but in his permissive will. This is just kind of a basic distinction that we discuss in theology whenever we talk about God's will. And so for Pope Francis to say God wills the diversity of religions in his permissive will, that's perfectly orthodox. That's 100% Catholic. That's always been Catholic. Of course, God wills it in that sense. God is sovereign, right? And so nothing is happening outside of his control. He permits it to occur. <clears throat> so creatures creating false religions, that's not outside of God's permissive will. He allows that. He permits it. So there's nothing wrong with what Pope Francis has said. Now, Schneider knows this clarification. It has been made public. Pope Francis has publicly made that clarification. But that clarification from Pope Francis did not receive any real traction in the news. All that we heard was Pope Francis teaches heresy. We didn't really hear, but hold on, no, he explains and clarifies what he meant. Now, we always say, hey, the Pope could be more clear. Well, here you go. He was more clear. But unfortunately, the media doesn't show you those things. So is it really an issue of the Pope not being clear or is it an issue of the media being very biased? I'll let you decide. But unfortunately, Schneider doesn't show us this information that he himself is aware of. He doesn't show it to us in credo. What's worse is Pope Francis had directly told this to Schneider in a face-to-face -face conversation. So it's not that just Schneider is aware of a papal audience. Schneider spoke to the Pope face-to-face -face, and the Pope told him, directly, one person standing next to each other, Pope Francis says to Schneider, I'm referring to the permissive will. Unfortunately, Schneider doesn't show that to you in credo. He lends you to believe that the Pope has taught heresy. But he didn't tell you this other side of the story, and it's something that he was aware of. So this was a voluntary an informed decision on part of Bishop Schneider to not show you the facts which change the entire situation and exonerates Pope Francis. I am not attributing malice to him. I'm not saying that he intends to deceive. What I am saying is that he intentionally chose not to show this to you. Maybe he thinks in his mind he has a justifiable reason for it, so I'm not attributing malice or deception to him, but this was an, an intentional and willful and informed decision on part of Schneider not to show this to the readers. Make of that whatever you will. I'll uh, continue to show you the interview here. It continues, 
Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Schneider says the aforementioned remarks of Pope Francis at the April 2019 Wednesday general audience are a small step towards a clarification of the erroneous phrase found in the Abu Dhabi document. Nevertheless, they remain insufficient because they do not refer directly to the document and because the average Catholic and almost all non-Catholics neither know nor understand the meaning of the theologically technical expression, permissive will of God, to which I ask, well, why didn't Schneider help people understand this truth? by not disseminating this false claim in credo, or at least if he does it, at least put a footnote saying, and by the way, Pope Francis has clarified this. Here's what permissive will means, and here's where he's not teaching heresy. Schneider was in a privileged position. If he believes that Pope Francis hasn't sufficiently explained this to everybody, Schneider was in a privileged position to help the Pope with that. Rather, instead of helping the Pope with that task, he actually chose not to show these things to people, which does what? Further exasperates the issue, further causes confusion, further brings a lack of clarity. So if he is going to say the Pope needs to be more clear, why doesn't Bishop Schneider help the Pope become more clear by showing people what the Pope has said? It continues. The Holy Father answered at once, saying that one must explain the phrase in the Abu Dhabi document regarding the diversity of religions in the sense of the permissive will of God. So Pope Francis did tell Schneider directly, and this is public, this is public information. He did tell him directly the Abu Dhabi document phrase is in reference to the permissive will of God. And Schneider told Pope Francis, since this phrase enumerates the objects of the wise will of God indiscriminately, putting them logically on the same level, the diversity of the male and female sexes must also be willed by God by his permissive will which means that he tolerates this diversity as he might tolerate the diversity of religions. Pope Francis then admitted that the phrase could be misunderstood, so he admits that there was a lack of clarity initially, and said, but you can tell people the diversity of religions corresponds to the permissive will of God. So Pope Francis tells Schneider face-to-face -face directly, you can tell everybody what I mean by permissive will of God in the Abu or by the Abu Dhabi document is the permissive will of God. You're free to tell everyone that, and he even clarifies it in a Wednesday audience. Now, again, let's look at the rest of what Schneider says in response to this, to which I replied, Holy Father, please, will you tell the entire church this? I left my verbal request with the Pope also in this written form. Francis kindly answered me with a letter dated March 5th, 2019, in which he repeated his words from the audience March 1st, 2019. In other words, Pope Francis did just as Schneider asked. He clarified it. He did just that. He went in his audience which was, again, to summarize, was April 3rd, 2019. So after his discussion with Schneider face-to-face, -face, he does clarify publicly. You didn't hear about it in the news. You still, to this day, heal the lie in the news. You still hear the distortion in the news. But you didn't hear the clarification from Pope Francis. And Pope Francis did exactly as Schneider asked. He clarified, rather than Schneider supporting the Pope, in this endeavor of this clarification, which he received explicit permission to do, and Pope Francis himself did. Rather than Schneider helping people understand and clarify, he chose not to show this and rather disseminated the false impression and the false accusation in Credo. We'll look at it again. In our own time, again, in the category of heresy, right? Honorius is a heretic in the category of heresy. In our own time, Pope Francis has publicly signed a document affirming the pluralism and diversity of religions are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. And so he deliberately chose not to show this to you. 
I don't know his intentions, don't know his motivation, so I'm not going to speculate on those. I am just telling you the facts. He deliberately, with full knowledge, chose to not show this to you. And it's not as if he has come out and said, hey, this one got by me in the editing process. I, you know, something slipped up. Here's how he has never come out and said that. So unless he explains, this is clearly an instance where he presented a false accusation and did not show you what exonerates Pope Francis. So please stop saying it's Pope Francis who was the main one creating the confusion. In this particular instance, there was some lack of clarity from Pope Francis. But then he clarified, did Catholic media support him in that? No. Did Bishop Schneider support him in that? No. Instead, Bishop Schneider continued to perpetuate the confusion by doing this in Credo. So who's really causing the confusion now? Is it Pope Francis or is it his critics? I'd say maybe 10% of the time Pope Francis has been unclear and caused some confusion. But I'd say probably 90% of the time, the confusion that we see surrounding Pope Francis is from the critics, either distorting, spinning, or neglecting to report what the Pope actually said. And then another false accusation uh, is, is implied here about Pope Francis teaching heresy on the death penalty. He also taught that the death penalty is per se contrary to the gospel. <clears throat> I'm relatively sympathetic to Schneider on this particular one. It is not an act actually a teaching. This is a quote from the address of uh, Pope Francis to participants in the meeting promoted by the Pontifical Council for promoting the new religion, or new evangelization, I should say. Uh, so, some uh, some papal critics would certainly say that that's a new religion, though, right? <laughs> so they would certainly hear it that way. No, new evangelization. Uh, Synod Hall, Wednesday, 11th, October 2017. This is where I think we can offer some criticism of Pope Francis, but first of all, this is not magisterial, so it is not actually a teaching of the Pope. And then number two, Two, where he does refer to this. If you read the whole thing, I think the worst that you can say about Pope Francis in this is that what he says is true, but it does need to be balanced out. Um, when he says that the uh, death penalty is per se contrary to the gospel, it would be exactly like me saying thievery or theft, I should say. Theft is against the natural law. Now, it is against the natural law. Yes, yes. Theft is against the natural law. Now, if God gives you the green light to engage in this, it is no longer sinful, right? And when God gave the Israelites the green light to plunder Egypt, that was not sinful. When God gave the green light in the Old Testament to the death penalty, imposing the death penalty was not sinful. But unless God gives you the green light to do these things, in and of themselves, they might be contrary to something else. So in the case of theft, if God doesn't say, hey, you could take this stuff, then it would be contrary to the natural law. And in the case of the death penalty, if God does not give you the authorization to engage in this, you could say that this in and of itself is contrary to the gospel. And if you read Pope Francis, you'll see how that is the case. And also go and watch my interview with um, Dr. Brueger, where we go over the history of this, and you'll you'll see where this is coming from. And so while I agree that what Pope Francis is, is saying is true, I do want to say, but Pope Francis could have balanced this out better, and I think he should have, and he should clarify this particular part because there are a lot of critics out there who are not clear on this point. So this is another instance where I do think this is the 10% of Pope Francis where Pope Francis could do better. This is that 10%. But have the critics also done uh, any help to the Holy Father in clarifying these things? No, in fact, they slam him and accuse him of heresy rather than attempting to help clarify him, as I just did. So <laughs> I then need to ask some questions here in light of the very problematic things we've seen today from Credo. And today's not the only show that I've gone over Credo and showed very massive problems with it. I have to ask, 
why these men endorsed this document. Robert Cardinal Seurat, Bishop Joseph Strickland, Bishop Elias Nasser, Dr. Scott Hahn. I have to ask why did they endorse a document filled with filled with so many errors, theological errors, historical errors, and unfortunately false accusations, redefinitions of Catholic terms, all sorts of wild things have taken place here. Why did these individuals endorse this? And if it was because they didn't really look through it, they just kind of endorsed it because they assumed it would have been orthodox and they assumed it was a good catechism. Okay, will these individuals come out now and repudiate their signatures from this document? Or do they continue to endorse Credo, which accuses the magisterium of heresy, of teaching error. It also accuses the catechism of the Catholic Church of all sorts of things. And so it's a very problematic uh, document, frankly, filled with issues. Will these individuals come out and repudiate? I'm waiting. I'd love to hear some clarification. Or do they agree that Pope Francis teaches heresy? Do they agree with accusations? And do they agree with the problematic doctrines that we find in this catechism? I think they owe us an explanation since they have publicly endorsed these things. And so we should know, do they stand by an endorsement of a document filled with air? And if they won't clarify their position here, they're in no position to ask Pope Francis to clarify anything. So all of these men on here who have asked the Pope to be more clear or to clarify his orthodoxy or to clarify a document, none of them can ever ask the Pope to do that when they won't do the same. If they won't practice what they preach, that's a problem. And speaking of practicing what they preach, I'll lastly show you once more Schneider signing this document in 2022 along with Bishop Strickland and many others, accusing Pope Francis of teaching heresy and Desiderio Desideravi. His signature is fourth on the list. So he has falsely accused the papacy of teaching heresy. Has he repudiated his signature? No. To clarify, because some of my accusers have said, Michael, you've signed this document too. No, I did not. I have never signed this document. That is not a true statement. Never. Have I ever endorsed or signed this document? From the day it was released, I created a video criticizing it. I have never signed this document. I have signed a document years prior to this, and I have repudiated my signature for years now publicly. I'm the one who brought it to everyone's attention publicly. I've repudiated it publicly. I've gone to confession. I've had the theological censors lifted. So I am in good standing with the church and have repudiated and publicly retracted. And so when we speak of practicing what we preach, I've done just that. And so now I ask Bishop Strickland, Bishop Schneider, and everyone else who has signed this document to publicly retract their signature because it is a false claim that Pope Francis has taught heresy. I'll put a link in the show notes where I show where they erred. And if what they're saying is true, they would also have to condemn St. Paul in Romans chapter 10 of heresy. They don't condemn St. Paul. You also don't need to condemn Pope Francis for this document because all Pope Francis was doing was repeating what St. Paul said in Romans 10. So <clears throat> they, again, need to retract publicly this. And I'm in the best position to say that because I'm the one who did it first. So I publicly retracted from a very different document my signature. And so I practice what I preach and I ask that they would consider doing the same, that they would publicly retract it and also consider the sacrament of reconciliation because there's certainly some other things to consider there, but that I'll leave that to their conscience. Okay. Hey, thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully this has been an eye opener for you to show you. Yeah, there's some massive problems here and, uh, Perhaps we're going to get some clarification from Bishop Schneider 
on why he didn't give us this other information. Hey, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. And of course, check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me or the GoFundMe and PayPal link there in the show notes. All right. See you later. God bless. Are you a Catholic thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? Or are you a Protestant discerning whether or not to become Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy and engages all of the arguments that Eastern Orthodox use against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them. I show that they are in error and in fact, they're inconsistent because the things that Orthodox are objecting to are in fact found in their own tradition. So the fullness of the faith can only be found in the Catholic Church. Check out the book right now at shop.catholic.com for your copy today. Hey everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. ReasonInTheology.com